Hey, everybody. Um, thanks to um, all of you who uh, are joining us for the I don't know what number um, book club that um, FPF and friends have been uh, hosting now. Um, good to hear and see you all. Uh, warning for those of you who are in the broader uh, audience. Um, we try to make this as inclusive as possible. So if you raise your hand or you have a good question, um, we will look to pop you in on, uh, on the video and uh, let you join us. Um, I'm really delighted um, that uh, many of you in the, the voting chose the Section 230 book. Jeff gave it a, a, a memorable uh, title, but um, to me, it's been the Section 230 book. Um, and um, one that I know I needed to read both to freshen up my understanding of the law, as well as to deal with the fact that it's going to be the biggest public policy issue of the year, probably for Congress, certainly one of the issues in Europe. Um, uh, for those of us who are data protection geeks, of which some but not all of you are, obvious intersections with things like the right to be forgotten or algorithmic um, discrimination um, uh, and regulating algorithms. So, so these solutions are creeping into privacy law um, in some ways. Um, let me quickly tell you who's here. I'll let them uh, say a bit of a hello. And then we're delighted that we have uh, the author. And I say delighted because who knew I mean, this was always an interesting book, and I know Jeff, you you got a lot of attention and engagement. But but who knew that the past year between you know Trump being uh, uh, removed, between you know two thirty becoming such a central focus, um, you know I, I saw you popping up on the likes of sixty Minutes and other media that are that are not the daily life of most you know academic um, uh, writers. So uh, interested in hearing whether um, becoming an internet celebrity has. Uh, change things a little bit uh, for you, especially as somebody who's out there and active on Twitter and the like. So um, I'll leave Jeff to last because I'll introduce him and I'm gonna ask him to give a bit of a setup um, for, for the book. Um, but let me uh, go around um, and I'm gonna just call on each of our, our uh, discussants here in the room uh, just to give their, their name and anything else. Um, we've got some people affiliated with organizations but maybe not speaking on behalf and others who are here just because they're, they're thoughtful book readers. So um, Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda O'Keefe. Um, I'm a senior vice president and assistant general counsel at Citigroup, but I'm definitely here sharing my own views. Most of what I say today will probably horrify <laughs> my employers, um, but I work in privacy, I work in data privacy and technology and intellectual property law. Uh, so I definitely have an interest in this, in this aspect, but media and communications law is not my field of expertise. So please forgive me if I say something that's completely wrong. It's a book club. And don't if hold someone it doesn't say city. something wrong and spill their wine, then it's not a, not a good book club meeting. Uh, Marcus. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marcus Stalling. I'm here as host on behalf of FPS, a law and policy fellow here, fellow here, and looking forward to this conversation. Like Jewel said, it's, it's uh, come at a very important time, especially after January 6th. And I know Jeff will be pressed to defend, you know, his, uh, his stance on Section 230. And I look forward to hearing everyone's questions. And Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Schaller. I'm a fellow at Zwilgen, definitely here in my own capacity. Um, I am not an expert in 230, although I have, you know, great interest in the topic. I was an intern at FPF during my last semester of law school. So I always love a chance to engage and hang out with such a great group, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Awesome, and Eileen Hershenov. Hi, thanks, Jules. Uh, so I am currently the Senior Vice President of Policy for ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which tracks extremism and cyber hate uh, and our government relations, civil rights, and Center for Technology and Society report up to me. Prior to crossing the line to looking at extremists and the harm, I was the sort of on the other side of things uh, in some ways, at least when you talk to 230, as the general counsel of Wikipedia. Uh, without 230, I don't know how Wikipedia, as, as Jeff has said in his book, it's not clear to me how Wikipedia could survive in its current form or anything near it. And prior to that, I was the general counsel for Consumer Reports, where I did a lot of media law defense before that at, uh, for 10 years at the Soros Foundations and before that at the ACLU. Um, Jeff, I'm going to go to you, but uh, let me just give a quick shout out that in the about 100 or so, 105 or so in the audience, we've got folks from uh, 
trade groups, um, big law firm lawyers. Um, we have some civil society people who are engaged in this issue. Um, um, early internet thinker folks uh, and scholars like Michael Nelson, um, uh, Mark McKenna. Uh, oh gosh, a lot of um, a lot of international folks. Uh, Laura Gell, who is one of the uh, senior legal people back at AOL, um, uh, when I was paying attention to only privacy, and I think as one of the people in the litigation side, probably was dealing uh, with this. So Laura may have some interesting uh, nuggets. Um, uh, Jordan Fisher at Drexel Law, who's got um, a number of uh, students in his class uh, tuning in. Um, uh, feel free to post in the in the chat and I'll uh, I'll flag that you're there or at least the, the rest of the audience will, will know you're there if you're somebody who uh, wants to uh, wants to do so. And then without further ado, um, Jeffrey Kossef. Um, Jeff, a little, what, can you tell me something about your life before 2.30? Because to me, you are 2.30, living and breathing. Um, but uh, you, you practiced before going into academia. Can you give us a quick snapshot? Yeah, so before I say it, first, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to everyone who read my book. Uh, I still have a bunch of family members who haven't read it. It's a tough sell. So um, I appreciate anyone who reads the book. But um, I have to give the disclaimer that I'm only speaking on my own personal capacity. I'm clearly not here representing the U.S. Defense Department. Uh, that should be obvious. Uh, but in terms of my background, I, out of college, I was a technology re reporter, and then I covered Congress in D.C. for the Oregonian newspaper when I uh, went to law school at night at Georgetown. Uh, after I clerked, I practiced um, media and privacy and cybersecurity law at Covington and Berlin for a few years before I came to the Naval Academy. So I've always been interested in the intersection of the First Amendment and the internet. And um, I started, it was really 2015 because I had used Section 230 um, when I was representing uh, mainly news clients who had user comments and we get complaints about user comments. And I was able to send a one page letter to the person complaining about it saying, um, yeah, I, I know you don't like what someone wrote about you in the comment section, but uh, the, you know that section 230, so you can go away. And they went away and I thought, it, it was always curious to me why they would just go, why we have something in the law that provides that sort of protection. And so when I went into academia, I wanted to start writing about it. Now, um, I'll do something that's a little odd for a book club. Um, I will admit, and I'll briefly read from, um, one of the many rejection letters that I got when I, um, when, when I started sending a proposal around for writing a book about section 230 of title 47 of the United States code. Um, th and these were only to academic press. So um, unfortunately I have some reservations concerning the potential audience for this work. Increasingly even university presses are being forced to take on projects that will appeal to an audience beyond specialists. In the immediate field, I, field, I do not feel that your work will have sufficiently broad potential readership to allow us to publish it successfully. And that was one of the kinder ones. Um, so that, that was the state in like 2015, 2016. Um, obviously a lot has changed. I did not expect that I would, it's been out for about two years. I, I didn't think that I would still be talking about section 230. I have, I'm finishing up work on my next book about anonymous speech, which comes out next year. And I would actually rather spend even more time on that than on Section 230, but it, but it continues to really be in the news. And what I would say, and I mean, I, I, I'm not going to do my normal talk about my book because we're going to talk about the book <laughs> in the club. Uh, but uh, so I guess what I'll just say is when we're looking at problems, and there's a lot of problems on the internet right now, a lot of problems that were caused in whole or in part by the internet. Um, I would first always want to know, is it a section 230 problem? Uh, and th that's, that's what I always look at first when I'm looking at these things. And sometimes it is, uh, but sometimes it's not. And uh, I, I'm not gonna go through the media coverage right now, but I, I will say that there is a lot of media coverage that just has false information, both about section 230 and the first amendment. Uh, I'll just, my, 
right after my book came out, I was so excited. The New York Times interviewed me for uh, the first time I'd been quoted by them. I was so excited. They used one sentence, but it was a big front page story on the business section. And um, it said, this is why hate speech, this is what protects hate speech on the internet. And they showed a picture of section 230. And then, uh, and then underneath it, it said, because this law protects it. They had to write, run a correction the next day saying the first amendment in the United States protects hate speech. Um, and the, but it, the same thing is true with things like um, saying that section 230 prohibits platforms from, from um, censoring certain viewpoints. Um, that's not true. Section 230 wants to give the platforms that breathing room, whether they have exercised that responsibility effectively is another story. But uh, there's a lot that really has to be broken down and we have to be precise in terms of the mechanics of the law. So, um, that, so that's what I hope to do as I continue talking about Section 230. But um, I, I don't know what the next step how we Yeah, well, let me ask you a quick question right away. Um, uh, since you pointed out the you know, New York Times even, um, obviously various legal figures, various political figures. Um, mm -hmm. there, there was an op-ed, I think this weekend, right? In uh, was the Wall Street Journal by a prominent academic who is a constitutional oh, yeah. scholar. <laughs> um, there are obviously some leading senators who, who are, you know, whatever our view of their politics, fairly smart, you know, lawyers. Is it your sense these folks know exactly what they're doing and they're in it, you know, for the pol politics of, you know, beat the platforms, argue, you know, wh what Mr. Trump or other folks, you know, thought or didn't think, or, or is it that this is just this uniquely confusing conflation, you know, do, do, you, do you subscribe, you know, nefarious political intent to some of the, you know, very prominent people who seem to be, you know, of the view that 230 can solve the political bias issue or, uh, you know, or, or issues that they seem to have that are much more tied to the First Amendment? So I don't want to get into the mindset of any of the people who are saying that platforms should be fully neutral, but I'll say that I think the people who are leading the charge, um, not naming any names, I think they do know better. And I think they know that you look at Section 230 and it does not say anything about requiring neutrality. It, and if you look at the history of it, um, it doesn't require neutrality. If you talk with the two people who wrote it who are still alive and won't stop talking about it, they say they don't want to require neutrality. Uh, I think a lot of people believe what these people say. And then it becomes this myth that I, I think it, it's this weird form of misinformation that it's hard to control once it's out there. But I, I think a lot of, and I talk with some of the people, not naming any names, but some of the I, I meet with anyone who wants to talk about Section 230, and I say, you know, come on, what what do you think, what lawsuit, without Section 230, what lawsuit could someone file for having had their content moderated? And they say, well, for them, they view it as transactional. They say, you know, what we see is there's this law that benefits the big tech platforms, and we think the big tech platforms are unfair to us, so we should punish them by taking away this protection, regardless of the impacts or what it requires. So I, that's my best estimate, but it's weird. Because, I mean, I barely wrote about it in the book because it wasn't even a thing. Uh, like in 2017, no one was saying Section 230 requires neutrality. That's really only been in the last year or so. What did you, before I bring in the others in a minute, let me ask you one more question about the book process. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had litigated, you dealt with these cases uh, to some degree uh, as a lawyer and, and then as an academic. Um, so as you went through and did your research to sort of chart out, um, you know, the, the book, um, were there any areas where you refined or, or nuanced your sort of, did you end up with a greater appreciation for, wait a second, judges have gone so broad um, and here's where uh, obviously, you, you do propose some very narrow sort of solutions, but any, you know, did you learn something that changed your kind of broader idea of solutions uh, 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 as part of the research for the book? 
Yeah, I did. And I, I think, I, I mean, in particular, I think the Backpage case was was a tough one. Uh, that was one where I, I still think it was wrongly decided, but it's what happened. I mean, that, that's how the First Circuit ruled. I, I, thought, I thought there was enough evidence that Backpage was contributing to the illegal content, but um, I, so, so, I mean, I, and I, so I testified in the Senate or in, in the House uh, in favor of uh, an amendment, which is not the amendment that they ended up uh, putting in in FOSTA. I think the amendment they put in is more confusing and does more harm. But I think when there are those specific types of harms and when the Section 230 is not allowing uh, the people to hold the bad actors accountable. I, I think that I'm, I'm not one of those people who says you, you can't change section 230 under any circumstances. Eileen, let me bring you in. I see you have already flagged a, a, a question, but uh, in addition to maybe raising that, I want to hear your reaction. You, you've been a scholar of this because you lived it at, at Wikipedia and obviously now dealing both with the ADL's goal of um, stopping hate, um, but also doing it in a way that's legally uh, wise and with respect for the First Amendment and so forth. What, um, what was this sort of a bunch of cases you had already, you know, read the opinions the minute they came out? Um, what did you, what did you as sort of a, an expert in the space learn um, from, um, uh, from the book? Well, I will tell you that in, while I was general counsel for Wikipedia, um, I mentioned in my introduction, I don't know what we'd have done, with, what we'd do without 230. Um, I, I would say the bulk of the threats that we were able to just bat away were um, very problematic defamation and civil rights suits. That's what I saw most often designed to remove content uh, that the subject of an article did not want there. It was content that was almost always in my view in the public interest. Um, and, uh, and I don't know how you would have a, I, I think Wikipedia, which has of course flaws like everybody does, does uh, is sort of the best result of, I don't know if you'd call it web 1.0 or 1.5. I mean, it is an experiment that shouldn't have worked and that did. And I don't know that eliminating or really decimating 230 would get rid of it totally, but would get rid of it in a way that it, it, it works now in the way that you have communities that really do by and large self-govern. And of course, one of the reasons it can do that is it's not a, a social media platform. It's an online encyclopedia. So there are rules that it has. Nonetheless, it's often a baby with the bathwater situation, both in Europe and in discussions in the United States, when they talk about going after tech platforms. In Europe at times, that's been dealt with by a very explicit carve out uh, when they brought in liability for online encyclopedias. But I wanted to say a couple of things and then ask Jeff a question. Um, where I work now, we're very concerned about the incredible amount of hate online. Most of that, of course, is what we call lawful awful, that getting rid of 230 not only wouldn't affect it, but might even increase it. And just like there's this um, either intentional or ignor uh, confusing conflation of 230 and the First Amendment and 230 and net, net neutrality. So there is also similarly with about hate speech. But Jeff, in your book, you talked about wanting and, and coming out after you looked at Backpage in particular, uh, wanting a very narrow one federal standard exception, a carve out for sex trafficking. I'm wondering sort of two parts to the question. In the years since you finished your book, as you've watched what's happened with QAnon and this huge broad conspiracy theory, quite harmful that went for, it was mainstream to normalize far beyond smaller groups of sex traffickers, terrorists, even proud boys, you know, these real extremist groups to now being so mainstream. Where to, is there anything that you've seen either with the extremism or the QAnon that has changed your mind about exceptions to 230, would you and or would you say, yes, we should have a series of, as I proposed for sex trafficking, narrow carve outs? Yeah, so I obviously I've thought a lot about it um, since what's happened on January 6th in particular. And I, so, so it's tough because uh, the lawful but awful content, I, I think it's hard because that's kind of fluid uh, to get 
to, to be able to know what exactly is right at that barrier. Um, I, I think having a carve out to section 230 to go after uh, lawful speech, first, I, I think there would still be protection. So I think the problem is the, the, the in like 95% of the section 230 problems that, that, that I confront, the first thing is what, let's say section 230 did not exist. What is the first amendment protection and what would the government be able to do without, um, with, with, if section 230 didn't exist? Now, um, in, in terms of the misinformation, that's tough because there has to be at least a certain level of harm to get beyond some of the precedent like Alvarez, where you know speech that's false standing alone is going to be protected. Um, we have a, I, I mean, to the extent the government wanted to do, do something um, and thought that it would fall within the First Amendment, we have, uh, we have always had a full exception in uh, to Section 230 for federal criminal law. Um, and so, I, I, I mean, I think the, I, so I, I think that, the, so it's not a section 230 issue. It's, you know, I, I don't know how you go after that speech that we all want to go after, but I don't know how you do that um, in a way that, uh, would, that would not raise first amendment issues. So um, that's always, I, I mean, Backpage is a good example because it ended up getting shut down a few days before Foster was signed into law. And it was shut down because the FBI was able to seize that page because of the federal criminal exception to uh, 230. So yeah, I mean, I, I think these are definitely um, reason, I, reasons to rethink, you know, what, how do we want the legal landscape for the internet? But uh, more often than not, I think it's a First Amendment problem. So, you know, you raise an interesting point and I'm gonna go to Amanda Marcus Halla. Uh, it seems like there's really two discussions that are happening here, and one is overshadowing and, and making the other one harder to have, right? There's this big discussion about, oh my God, there's all this nasty stuff that is doing whatever harm to society. Um, it's clearly speech. Um, it's clearly going to be protected. There may be some nuance around whether or not, um, although I guess the case law is pretty well settled, um, although maybe you'll tell me it's not, um, if, if I simply want to make it easier for platforms to dismiss and not even have to deal with claims as opposed to the publisher, right? I mean, as again, someone who dealt with content moderation during my AOL day, um, the fact that you would win cases wasn't the point. If someone was going to be um, uh, you know, suing you and, and you were the deep pocket uh, and you didn't even have maybe the information to, to know uh, what was going on, you might just take things down or have to have a massive sort of operation, even if it is protected speech, as opposed to lots of individual actors who, who are actually the ones you know, with the, the, the knowledge. So I, I guess, um, do, do you think making that more painful um, is probably a First Amendment, uh, or is that really where 230 has taken the law further? But, but let me put that aside just for a second. So it, so it seems like there's this you know, issue of, you know, could you make life more difficult with more litigation, even though you know, players would, would, would sort of win? And is that a 230 or a First Amendment issue? Um, but, but clearly um, there's a whole nother issue of people who are worried about uh, really you know, uh, sex trafficking, uh, you know, criminal, but maybe not a federal crime you know, activity where uh, it's been declared, uh, I guess, Citroen and, and Franks in their paper said, uh, said you know, uh, the, the 230 has turned the um, uh, internet into a speech machine, things that would be completely illegal if I did them offline, because doing it online means publishing it all of a sudden, it gets constitutional protection, while if I was just selling those bad products, you know, I might be uh, in jail. And, 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 and how to deal with those sorts of where you carve out things that really aren't speech but are being treated as speech um, or where you have some exceptions, it, it feels like that is a completely different conversation, but they're being blended together. Is that a fair way to think about it as a sophisticated layperson or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it is. I think there is, I, I mean, I think um, Danielle and Marianne's um, critique is the, 
reasonable one, not the, you know, we should let everything on the internet, no matter how harmful it is, and we should get rid of keeper protections if a platform decides to moderate. I mean, I think the concerns that they raise in their scholarship is are exactly right. I mean, I think, um, and 230 can be changed. So, I, I mean, there are some people who uh, will, for, for example, uh, point to the um, the use of Section 230 by uh, Amazon to immunize it for um, goods that third party sellers, uh, product liability issues. And that really comes down to a value judgment. So, I mean, yeah, you could see why you would want to hold Amazon liable for a product that really harms someone and that Amazon was able to make money off of selling. But um, you do that, that's fine, but you have to keep in mind that then there will probably be fewer third party sellers and there will be more centralization to sites like Amazon. So, I mean, again, that, it's all a value judgment of how, how we want the internet to look. I mean, the internet, because of how Section 230 has allowed the internet in the US to be structured, it has been very, um, it, in terms of speech, very decentralized in that the platforms, uh, there often will be platforms for people to say what they want to say. Um, I, but I think, I mean, obviously what, what we're discussing now with 230 might make it so that um, they, if 230 were repealed, there would be perhaps fewer outlets. Um, the, the newspaper that still allows user comments at the bottom of the story might not think it's worth it. Uh, and the social media companies might have more restrictive policies, which could be a good thing if, if you want them to be more restrictive. But um, I can say half the people on Capitol Hill who call me think that would be, be a bad thing. So I feel like right now we don't really have an alignment on what the problem is. And that makes it really hard to figure out a solution. And that that's really what I grapple with a lot when I talk with folks about this. Amanda, let me bring you in. Yeah, so you mentioned you thought the back the back page case was wrongly decided. I wanted to go just a little further back in the case history to the Zarin case and get your views on whether or not you think that was rightly decided at the time. I think if you read it now in light of the online services market today, it makes sense. But at the time when you're looking at you know, 230 as being designed to do two things, one, to encourage companies to develop interactive online services without being liable for third-party content, and two, to encourage services to set their own standards for user content, well, AOL didn't do that in that case. So why... I, I, I'm just a little surprised that the court didn't at least some, to some extent, draw from Cubby and Smith. I'm surprised that they departed from it to the extent that they did. I just don't think that Zarin, the Zarin ruling really meant the intent of the law, but I'm, I'm curious to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a completely um, understandable reaction. And I have had that same reaction as I've read the cases many times for the book and afterward. Um, I will say that there were two things that made the difference in the Zarin case. Uh, the first was that they got Judge Wilkinson, who is a former newspaper editor, really kind of pro free speech, and he was going to make a statement. Uh, the second thing was that uh, AOL hired Pat Barone, who is one of the best uh, litigators out there, to, um, to come up with a theory of the case that um, was really, I mean, what, when you look at, it was only based on what Section 230 said, and no, there was no precedent interpreting it, and it went against some of what some people had interpreted the common law of defamation to say, and he managed, I mean, his, his briefs are uh, really excellent in terms of laying out a very confident and precise case, but uh, I think that had there not been Judge Wilkinson on that panel and had AOL not had the representation that it had, I think that um, Section 230 could look very, very different. And uh, I think I probably would not have been in a position to write a book about Section 230 because it probably would not be all that important. Marcus Ohana, thoughts? Yeah, so I guess sort of not limited to any one case, but one thing that really struck me in the book was how 
limited or non-existent forms of redress are for victims of online harassment or false statements about people. Um, I think there was a link in the chat to a New York Times article this past week about really just sad cases of people who were targeted by destructive and vindictive um, you know, former acquaintances who just wanted to ruin their reputation. And although I appreciate what 230 is trying to do, it seems like a major problem, not maybe not for that law, but maybe that there's not an accompanying mechanism for redress. Because as you discussed, there are options to sue websites, which often aren't successful. And then some courts say, well, you could have sued the posters. But as you point out in the book, it's often not realistic because it can be really hard to unmask them. So I guess one big question I have for you is, do you think that we need some forms of redress either from other laws or from adding that to 230? Um, do you think we have anything to learn from our friends in Europe who have things like the right to be forgotten and the right to um, correct inaccurate information? Um, curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So one thing that I really regret not being able to put in the book because it's an opinion that came out literally the week after I sent them my final manuscript and I said to the publisher, come on, I've got to uh, add this. And they said, no, <laughs> it's locked. Um, is a case where um, someone, a, so section 230 says you can't sue the platform, but you always can sue the user. Um, and so one of the things that um, Section 230 allows, or should, should allow, I would say, is if you sue the user and you get a judgment that it's defamatory or illegal, you should be able to get a takedown order. I mean, if it's adjudicated to be defamatory. Um, and many platforms abide by, will, will honor those, but some don't. Uh, this case in California, uh, the California Supreme Court held that uh, Section 230 even prevents a collateral takedown order. And I, you know, I, I have not talked with Cox or Wyden about that case, but I don't see it sort of meeting the intent of Section 230. And I don't see why if material is adjudicated to be defamatory, uh, people should be able to get it taken down. And I, this is where a lot of the 230 defenders will really part with me on this, but I mean, I testified in the Senate uh, last July telling them uh, that they need to put that in reform because that gets at really the most important remedy for a lot of these cases, which is get the material taken down. Um, it's not that you're looking to make money, you, you wanna save your reputation and you can't do that if you, even if you've won a defamation judgment against someone who has no money, and the platform is saying, no, we're not going to take it down. I, I don't think that's right. And that's a key point for those of us on the sort of data protection side who, you know, maybe on the US have had this instinctive reaction, right to be forgotten, you know, terrible, um, w without perhaps, I think, the more nuanced critique, it, which is not that different countries can have a different, you know, balance of what it takes to go to a publisher or go to someone who who um, uh, posts information and say, hey, you've got no right, you've invaded my privacy, there isn't you know, an out outweighing interest, but rather um, who should be making that initial assessment, right? Um, should it be uh, a court um, that can look into the facts, that can allow both sides to argue, no, it's good for me to publish these nasty things about you, you're a nasty person and you're running for office or you, you, know, you're, 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 you work with young children and, and it needs to be known as opposed to you know, Google or some distributor who, upon your request, must take it down for, or, or somehow, what, Google around and try to find out whether this person is actually running for dog catcher, you know, dog catcher in that village, therefore it is of, you know, of public interest. And, um, uh, you know, and, and I think a lot of the critique from the US side has sort of been this, that would never fly here, as opposed to, no, we, we've got, you know, we've got our First Amendment, but we still have places where you can get someone to take stuff down. Now let's have a, a process where it isn't solely in the hands of, you know, industry or um, others who do it without a full-fledged, you know, um, uh, assessment of this issue. Um, Eileen, I, I um, you, you know, you're, you're here as you, um, but you're, you're sitting in the middle of these issues and I, I would love to be sort of a bird in your brain uh, on your shoulder as you um, and the organization sort of think through um, 
you know, because because I think you're interested in not solely the, you know, are, are there some crimes that are you know slipping through, uh, but but you are interested in the broader societal. What do we do about all the toxic stuff that is happening, and is two thirty the vehicle to, you know, detoxify what seems to be creating this national angst? Um, uh, welcome your, you know. <laughs> Welcome your thinking because sure. you're, you're really was, sitting at the middle of this. You know, and it was so great to reread Jeff's book uh, this past weekend because, you know, it's uh, I'm not religious about much, but this is a is a, one of the, the texts that comes close to a Bible for me, Jeff. So uh, um, so for me, what's been really difficult is straddling the line between a being a lawyer and being an advocate and thinking sometimes about what is an advocacy position. Uh, or a menu of ad advocacy positions that use the threat of legislation, of regulation, of litigation, of public pressure campaigns like the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that ADL was one of the initiators of versus, you know, very specifically if I was litigating or if I was drafting. So what I've learned moving from being a general counsel to a head of policy is I've sort of, it, and it's been a very difficult deprogramming, I've loosened up and I, I'm, I'm also reminded that when I look back at where platforms made some steps that I think are good steps in content moderation, it was under pressure. It was under terrible reputation pressure or their own employees looking uh, potentially to leave or the antitrust or the 230 legislation or regulation. So I certainly believe uh, call me a cynic, that unless that pressure continues and it's real, it's not a bluff, that we won't see some changes that we need to see. Um, I'm also a big worrier about unintended consequences, about doing things that will just ensconce the monopolistic or near monopolistic power of those platforms that can afford to meet higher, more costly bars in litigation. That being said, said, I've come around from my ACLU days to the horror of my old colleagues to believing that there needs to be some reform of 230, but that it is one, there is no silver bullet, sorry to use a very hackneyed uh, uh, you know, it's epithet there, but um, I think there have to be public pressure campaigns. I think there has to be oversight, not just oversight and transparency, but accountability. I think 230 carefully reformed, and I have, you know, some ideas, and I'm sure Jeff does too, on what that might look to, are all part and parcel. And it is hard to sell. I mean, this is a hard area anyhow. To say there is no magic bullet and that 230 isn't, nor is something the FTC can do, nor is more, you know, a, a better uh, transparency reports, but that it's going to be all of these things, including the long-term education. That's a tough one, but there is nothing else. I think the thing, I think the thing that's so hard now is that you know I, like many of us, I am coming out of a period that was so, where I was so shocked to realize how fragile democracy is and how much of it is norms. So when I look as an advocate and a policy person, I'm looking at a multifaceted, iterative, and probably never-ending campaign. Um, but I do, that being said, I do think uh, I, uh, when I look at what's going on in Congress right now, there's a bill that I think is about to drop soon, which would have an injunctive relief carve out, Jeff, to go to what you just said. There's another that wants to get rid of the Amazon product liability policy. I don't know if this would work by calling it uh, changing information in those 26 words, uh, changing that to speech. And there's a lot of people, and I wonder if you would speak to this a little bit too. There are a lot of people that said the very wide application of 230 prevented the courts from developing case law to look at speech and the nature of speech when you had the scope impact virality uh, of, of you know, a global internet. Now you said in terms of Basta Sester in your book, even if the courts get it right, it was just too big a harm immediate to wait for them to get it. We had to legislate. It legislated more broadly, but I'm wondering a little bit about this argument. And it's it's one that you know Ben Wittes and Danielle Citrone also make in their proposal, like give it to the courts. Let, let's have case law about everything, public, for, public forum, uh, you know, uh, underpinnings of democracy. Uh, what is the internet? How do we look at speech on it? Yeah, so it, it's tempting. And I, so I draw on my time practicing uh, cybersecurity law to 
for why I have some concerns about having a speech-based reasonableness standard, because um, I met with too many chief information security officers when they would say, okay, well, what do we need to do to um, not get the FTC after us? And I'd say, well, you need reasonable security. They'd look at me like, what, 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 is, what is that? What, and, you, and, and I mean, the state data security law say reasonableness. And for data security, I, th I, I think it's understandable why you have that for speech because it is such an amorphous concept. I worry about waiting for decades of possibly conflicting state courts about uh, what is reasonable speech and what's a reasonable content moderation. And I, I think that that uncertainty of what the standard is. Now, if, if it was, um, we need specific moderation uh, steps and it's hard because things change so quickly and Congress only passes laws like every two decades. So it's hard to really understand how you would do this. But uh, my concern isn't as much with uh, putting, putting obligations on platforms. My concern is by just saying, let's make it reasonable and let the court sort it out. I, I just don't think that I, I, I would want to provide companies with a bit more certainty about what they should be doing, uh, because I, I think most of the companies want to be doing the right thing. So would a court handle, you think, the disinformation issues around a reasonable moderation um, effort? Um, uh, can, can you see a first, you know, something that meets First Amendment restrictions that says, you know, you need to restrict misinformation in this manner, uh, again, unless it's somehow inciting violence, uh, but, it, but simply just befuddling people about, I don't know, vaccine um, e efficacy or something like that. I think it's hard because I think uh, what it first has to do is you first have to um, figure out what, and I'm not saying to give up on it. I, I think it's just really hard because you have to define what is misinformation. So. Uh, there is a person on Twitter who I will not give any publicity to, who is a former New York Times reporter who basically makes his days uh, work to uh, basically say COVID is a hoax and the vaccines will kill all of us. I mean, that's basically what, what his themes are. And he, I mean, I, and I, I've not interacted with him because I'm not uh, in any way uh, an epidemiologist, but you look and you see some of the things um, that he says, and you can see the flaws in his interpretation. Um, and it, I, I mean, is that misinformation? I would, I would say there's reasonable arguments on both sides. I mean, he is um, giving his point of view on something, but it's a point of view that very well could cause people to not get vaccinated or not wear a mask or to engage in some behavior where they go to a crowded bar, anything like that. But I, I, I don't know if courts would be able to just say, under our current First Amendment laws, I don't know if courts would be able to say, okay, we're going to condition Section 230 protection on you um, blocking everything he says or some of what he says. So I, I, I'm not sure how or if that could address it. I would like to see Twitter be a little more aggressive independently about what he puts out there, because I think it's really hurting you. But Meredith I, Mays yeah. Espino uh, raises uh, uh, the use of AI, um, and uh, I know you, you've touched on this. Um, uh, let me make a quick point as you get ready to reply to that. Um, during my AOL days, we, um, we, we were heavy-handed in the way that perhaps, uh, you know, some are calling for today, right? We said, we are America, we are the 8 p.m. news, um, don't offend people, don't say nasty things, legal or not, we wanna create a certain family-friendly environment. And a lot of people felt that was too restrictive and they went elsewhere, um, but that was our, our strategy. So we didn't allow, for instance, and apologies for using terms that maybe offend people, or maybe they don't because they don't anymore. We wouldn't allow you to create a screen name um, uh, called um, Proud Dyke at AOL. And in fact, my team would constantly turn down those pejoratives and you couldn't say, 
I don't know, there was a group at one point that wanted to be Kikes on Bikes, a Jewish biker club. And we didn't allow this because our filters, these were bad words on the filter list that one of the teams I uh, managed maintained. We were the filter list keepers. And, um, uh, you know, we got a lot of complaints because at some point people were clearly using these terms in positive self-referential manners, while others were still using the term in a pejorative way. So we updated our policy and we said, the exception to this rule of you can't use these bad words is that if it appears to be used in a positive self-referential manner. And then we pushed out those policies to our call centers in Oklahoma City, in the Philippines, in Israel, in various places around the world. And all hell broke loose because the moderators who are smarter than AI couldn't always figure out what in the world was going on. Maybe it was someone going in and you know badgering the people in the Christian evangelical chat room. Uh, and then someone else was using it you know, to be part of his club. And um, I guess the idea that AI and, and those of us who talk about hate speech online in a way that says, hey, look at what this crazy person said about COVID, find our content sort of pulled down. So does anybody here have any hope that AI other than finding and queuing up the questions so that humans can look at it and then read the context before and after. And then even then, these aren't Supreme Court judges. These are staff people who are working for other people who then work for you know, the top tier uh, at the biggest companies. Is there any chance in hell that automation here is going to actually, um, other than in the most blatant cases, provide us a solution or a path out? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, I, I fully agree. I, I think um, I too often hear the, this assumption, you know, AI is just going to fix everything. And I, I don't want to dismiss it because I, there are certain things that uh, where technology does really help, like uh, child sex abuse material. That's something where, um, at least for known images and videos, the platforms have voluntarily implemented um, a pretty successful program that um, that has led to a lot of prosecutions of some of the worst actors. So I think that's an area where it helps, but I think you're exactly right. For a lot of this stuff, you need human judgment and um, the AI can help, um, but, the, but, but I don't, we're definitely not at a point now. I never like to think, say I know where technology is gonna go in the future, but everyone I've spoken with in the trust and safety departments of uh, the platforms, they, they uh, are quick to point out the limits of what AI can actually do independently. I would agree with that if I can just come in. I mean, you know, the, the metaphor everybody always uses is, look, you can't find a needle in a haystack, stack, but AI constantly, you know, the machine learning constantly uh, learning more and more can make that haystack very, very small. It's, uh, you know, at ADL, we're doing in the, the Center for Technology and Society that reports up to me is uh, run by a product guy who's doing this classifier for anti-Semitism and then he wants to go out to other forms of bigotry and hate. And they're using the incredible investigators uh, on extremism and anti-Semitism that we have and constantly teaching this. And they have a huge volunteer thing and it's independent so that if it's used and applied by tech, uh, platforms, we don't have to just go by what they tell us. Here's how much hate we found and here's how much we removed, which are, are you know, you don't know if it's true. It's not verifiable. Who I don't know what the denominator really is. It's how much they found. And of that, they say, how much did we remove? How much did AI get? How much did people flag? And it's just on like two metrics and it's pretty opaque and unhelpful. Um, so I think that that there are ways, and I think what, what you mentioned about the, the pornography and the child trafficking and what we've been able to do with the hash technology and checking out the, the, the pixels and everything is really uh, important and there'll be more of that. But also you're right, not only do the extremists and the language and the, what they do keep changing to keep ahead of the AI, not only is there a problem of the unintended you know, consequences of the bias of AI, but we're not always looking in the right places. So for example, um, on video games, and I'm not talking about just the actual video games, I'm talking about the adjacent platforms, whether that's something separate or internal, the chat or the video, there's a huge amount of white supremacist content and a huge amount of harassment. We're not looking at that in the way we're looking at Facebook and, and so on. 
uh, and YouTube and Google. So I don't see in a foreseeable future other than something than that constantly independently audited going to the communities is civil society involvement, better and better AI with human moderators who are continually trained as well. The uh, story by Kashmir Hill um, over the weekend um, in the New York Times, uh, uh, what impact do you think that's going to have? I mean, obviously, everybody who's interested in this issue is sort of going to read that and be like, oh, my God, um, you know, that's we, we need to fix this. Um, it, it just seems like the latest drop in this um, in this bucket. Any, you know, any reactions to um, uh, to that story? Uh, obviously, horrifying um, uh, case there. Yeah, I mean, I so I haven't seen the underlying court filings, and there have been filings in different countries. Um, and I so I mean, I think how much of it is a Section Two Hundred and Thirty issue was not totally clear because um, again, these this was litigation going on in uh, Canada, uh, and I this this is where. Um, my discussion about uh, being able to get a takedown order from a defamation judgment would be really helpful um, because this is something where she, the, this um, seemingly very troubled woman who had been posting all of, all of these things for decades, um, where she, they get a judgment against her. Um, and I mean, to their credit, ripoff report, which I actually included in the book is an example of a site that um, has a really firm stance, they took it down anyway, but a lot of some of the other sites didn't. And um, because of that reading of Section 230 that I think is not correct, they don't have to. Um, so I would hope that the art article might at least drive more consideration of the takedown issue. I get calls, I don't know if any of you do, as sort of the official, you know, tech policy person who somebody knows. Um, from people saying, can you recommend one of these services? You know, so, something has happened and there's something out there that they or a friend or a spouse, you know, doesn't like and it's showing up in search or the like. And I, I get questions all the time. Can you recommend one of the, you know, third party uh, tools that claims to, you know, help uh, help fix these things? I, I don't know. Do, you, do you, any of you get those sort of, uh, uh, that sort of outreach as well? They, they all seem to work the same way, more aligned sort of the pushing down content by creating some blog posts or a Wikipedia entry or something so that, you know, the bad stuff isn't, uh, uh, isn't optimized, but um, is, has anybody had to deal with anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I, I have. And I mean, there, for some of the sites, there are mechanisms, but other, I mean, it, it depends on what the content is. Um, I you know someone who uh, they had posted a negative review on a consumer re review site and the uh, business they reviewed posted all of their personal information on the <laughs> a, a, in the response and we were able to get that taken down pretty, pretty easily because, because of what they had posted. But oh, let me ask you, Eileen and Jeff, let me ask you this question. Um, you touched on the fact that not every country in the world has the same balance. And so that's helped obviously the big US companies and all that, but you know, Wikipedia does is, is global and, and many of the companies are, are global. Um, people are functioning without 230 in many other regions. Is it your feedback that, I mean, I don't know, Eileen did Wikipedia because it was some jurisdiction without uh, 230 have to take down stuff based on jurisdiction and and um you know is you know how is everyone else managing okay or, or are they managing okay out, outside the us europe obviously is in the middle of setting its own structure and their company countries that are at least been a little friendlier but there are there are of the uh, others that are not so what, what's the global take on this I can answer for Wikipedia and then maybe Jeff can you know talk about other platforms. So uh, you know when there started to be attacks on 230, just to plan well, we said like if we had to, all our servers are virtually everything's in the US. Um, and it's a it's a, Wikipedia is very interesting because actually, although technically the the small not-for-profit foundation that runs the servers uh, that hosts uh, the infrastructure 
by the way it's set up, we're not actually allowed, except in very limited circumstances, to take down things and to do. And were we to do that, the community that writes Wikipedia and all those different languages would probably rebel and fork. I mean, that could just be the end. There are times when we get a valid order and have to do something, we will. Now, of course, often we'd get an injunction in Spain or somewhere in Europe, and we didn't have to apply that. They they weren't able to over there, the, the groups that did the Spanish Wikipedians, because they had no access and ability. Now, what gets difficult is when some of those jurisdictions would start saying, well, we're going to just go after individuals, we're going to put criminal liability, or we're going to say, you know, people from the Wikipedia board, watch out if you come through Spain, because we're going to get you. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that can spiral out. But because of 230 and the First Amendment, um, and, and the fact that the servers and all the technical infrastructure was in the US, we were pretty good. And we would say we'd get in a um, they'd attempt to enforce a judgment, we'd say, no, it's against public policy. It's against US law. If 230 started to fritter away, we were thinking, where else could we go? We looked at Iceland, we looked at Ireland, there are a couple of places we looked at. There's no really good place. So it'd be a real problem. So well, the other thing Wikipedia did, which is about the self-governance is when there was an, uh, a court case where the complainant won, say again, in Spain or France or Germany, um, they, they would uh, they come to the, we would give it to the community and they would often decide to accede to their local law. Sometimes they want, and then we'd have all sorts of face-offs like I just mentioned. Then the last thing I'll mention is that of course, in these places that don't have the first amendment, and that's really one of the, if you wanna talk about American exceptionalism, that's one of the places I buy it. Um, it you know, you, you had laws that are now didn't work so well and are being amended like the in Germany or France, or they're looking at them like that you had to within 24 hours take something down. So on the one hand, yeah, you have these places without 230 and things are managing somehow. But I am as a former media lawyer, very concerned about some of the right to be forgotten. I, I, I empathize. Look, I also have a, an 18 year old son. I don't want something stupid he might've done, which he hasn't, but he could have uh, at 16 to be forever online, to be found by every future employer or, or university. At the same time as a media lawyer, what I saw and what I saw at Wikipedia, what they want taken down, I am so opposed to that. Uh, but that's the, the different ways in which uh, Wikipedia handled it. Jeff, and then let me quickly bring in Marcus and Amanda. Hey Jeff, I actually have two questions while we have you. Um, the first is kind of a broad one. I know you said in your book um, on balance, section 230 has provided net benefits to society. Um, do you still stand by that? And the second is about, um, uh, you know, in the wake of the GameStop controversy, my colleague, she actually flagged a great article in Bloomberg that talked about the issues that the SEC might face when trying to enforce some of these security laws um, from what they call kind of armchair analysts online and these message boards, it, you know, is there, are they gonna run into roadblocks? Is there something they can do now legally? So the first question about whether I still think 230 has on balance provided net benefits to society, I think, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, they're the inner, I, I think, the internet that we know today has provided provided so many benefits and there's also substantial harms we have to grapple with. Um, but again, when I get back to what I was saying at the beginning of the hour with the, um, whether it's a section 230 problem or another problem, a first amendment problem, a federal criminal law problem. Um, I, I think that we need to separate those out. Um, in terms of the GameStop, I, um, I spoke with one reporter about GameStop uh, to the extent where I realized that I should not be speaking with a reporter about securities law um, because that is something that I know nothing about. Um, and, and so I've learned uh, in the past year to only talk about what I know about and I do not know about securities law. Um, so I don't know what possible liability there might be. I will just say again, if it's a criminal securities law, that federal criminal, then it's not a section 230 issue. I don't know where there would be some sort of federal criminal lawsuit against the platform involving GameStop, but if there were, there, then that wouldn't be an issue. If it was a civil case, then, or even an SEC civil investigation, 
um, there could be 230 issues. But again, I just don't know enough about, I, it's hard for me to imagine what that would be for a platform. I definitely for the individuals, but uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm just not quite sure. Amanda, final point or question? Okay, yeah, I'll be quick. So uh, you mentioned just going forward, what's the solution? How do we solve the gaps that she already left open? You mentioned the inefficiencies of the reasonableness standard for content moderation requirements and letting companies kind of self-regulate from there. Mm -hmm. But can you have a prescriptive moderation standard without ending up with collateral censorship? Is there a way to do that? It's hard. I, I mean, I, I think that um, there could be some areas where, where it could be um, defined in a certain way where you don't have the collateral censorship. Um, one thing that I have, another thing I testified about was that it would be good to see like Congress just had with a Cyber Solarium Commission to have a commission that looks at platform moderation and what types of uh, changes would be possible and how to, how to cabin those and come up with uh, legislation that way. Now, proposing a commission in DC is not exactly the most headline worthy uh, <laughs> idea, but I, I do think that there could be ways to at least try to say, okay, we, we might require this particular action, at, even if it's just transparency as a commission mm -hmm. of 230. And I think that that would be something at least to look at. Anybody needs to drop as in a real book club, if there's a babysitter, if there's an appointment, <laughs> go ahead. But we'd be remiss if we don't at least put one question on the table um, that, uh, we, that, that has sort of been such a big part of this. Um, so if anyone has to drop, feel free. Again, we're, we're informal here. But Eileen flags the uh, algorithmic amplification, uh, the whole issue around uh, algorithms that maybe are addicting us or algorithms that are, are commercial and ads that are you know that are that are monetizing speech. What d does this give us a different vector for regulation? Um, uh, if you have an ad related to that content, or uh, Eileen, do you want to add a bit more uh, sort of nuance to to that point, and we'll see what people think about it. I'd really like to ask Jeff. Uh, I've been working with some experts. And it's hard uh, to talk about an algorithmic carve out. So yes, you have a right to speech in, in terms of our values, I'm not talking on private platforms on First Amendment right, but you've got a right to speech, but not reach. And what, how would you define algorithmic uh, uh, amplification and what kind of harms would you have to show to, to get through 230 and be able to start showing that that algorithmic uh, amplification caused the harm? Because remember in 230, what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to get to discovery to see, you know, not just get it batted away on a 230 motion to dismiss. Uh, the other thing is paid ads that, cause you know, it sort of makes sense. People think, feel good. It's like, well, yeah, if they're gonna take money. Now there's lots of ways that things are monetized, but let's just, let's forget that for a moment and say paid ads, there's gonna be something unlawful in that ad. We should be able to go after you. So I've looked at people who've been trying to say, can you fashion a carve out for a uh, algorithmic amplification or paid ads. And Jeff, I'm interested in your views. So I'm skeptical of being able to do that. Um, I worry about doing that um, and then causing what has been caused by what people currently misinterpret 230 to require, which is neutrality. So. Um, this goes back to when I was a journalist, we would have seminars with our, uh, the lawyers for our parent company. And even they advised us, they said, you know, we were just getting web comments and they said, uh, and this, so many journalists have told me this, that their newsroom lawyers say, uh, if you start to delete comments or edit them, then we lose our 230 protection and we become liable for all of them. And that was really bad legal advice, but it happened so much. And I worry that if we start saying, well, if we have some sort of algorithm uh, accountability, uh, if they lose their 230 protections for certain algorithmic behavior, then companies will uh, be hesitant to use algorithms, which in many cases do very good things and make the internet usable and safer for it. So I, I, I'm concerned about how that would be. I, I also think there are some First Amendment considerations as well, but um, my big concern is I don't want to, I, I think platforms have, have done a lot. They've not done nearly enough in terms of being responsible given the flexibility that they have under 230, but 
I don't want to be in a, in a situation where they feel constrained about using the technology. The um, Biden administration is talking about unity and lots of others are saying, how can it be unity? The other side is wrong and they didn't admit they're wrong, but there's clearly some you know, middle part of America that kind of wants to lower the tension and um, figure out how to bridge, um, de-radicalize, uh, engage. And, and there are clearly been some places where platforms have, uh, you know, had automated messages that, that you know, try to, uh, you search, you know, some misinformation, they're, they're labeling, they're doing various things. But it, it, it does seem like on a national effort, we need some, you know, ways to bridge gaps with, with people who are, you know, going down rat holes. Um, there's a lot of learning from cult deprogramming or at least talking to your adversaries and how people can end up being more reasonable. Um, it, 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 it doesn't seem like there's any major effort, right, other than individual sort of platform things with misinformation to, uh, you know, understand, you know, may, maybe we've learned and we've got some work, how do you de-radicalize if someone is going down the ISIS path? But um, is anyone aware of any major effort to figure out how do you create a, a path to lowering the tension, renewing respect, you know, communicating with, with people maybe who are not evil, but are, you know, hate, hating somehow because uh, they're, they're out there online. Um, uh, Hannah, I'll let you get in there. I don't know if that's what you were looking to re reply to, but um, wonder if that's sort of a, a path to close on. And then Jeff, maybe we'll get you for a second on why anonymous um, communication uh, is your next uh, path here. C clearly there's a some sort of link, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's all good. I was gonna mention something adjacent, which is that in section 230, there's this, or behind it, there seems to be this assumption like platforms are going to be responsible. They are gonna moderate. They are going to want to um, have a positive user experience. And as we've seen, there have been steps, but as a couple of us have mentioned, sometimes that just comes after immense media pressure or immense user demand. And part of the problem seems to me to be that there's not a requirement of responsibility. Um, and I know that's a broad term, it would have to be more defined. There's not really a requirement of accountability. Section 230 is like, here's the carrot without the stick. Um, so I think maybe part of going forward is how do we create the right incentives for tech companies to be responsible and to help um, stop sort of the harmful toxicity that we're seeing. Jeff, I don't know if you have views on whether or not a law could even be fashioned that would be helpful enough or if it would just be too vague or if that's any part of the way forward. Yeah, so it depends on what exactly you're trying to get them to moderate. Again, I, I would say that um, the platforms have whatever they do, people on the high profile situations, you're going to have a lot of people who praise them and a lot of people who say they stepped too far. And this happened when they took away the Twitter account of the president of the United States. Um, there, uh, I won't speak for the political views on anyone who, of anyone here, but there may be people who think that was a long overdue move. Uh, but I'll also say there are a lot of people I hear from who say that that was a horrific censorship of the president. And I, so, so when you get down to the specific decisions, I think they're hard from a policy perspective. And then on top of that, if you're getting down to moderating speech that is constitutionally protected, there's going to be a First Amendment issue with imposing an unconstitutional condition on a government benefit, which is what Section 230 would be. So that, that's why I'm, I, 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 I'm open to looking at what those would be. I just think um, there would have to be some, it would have to be targeted at purely unprotected speech and it would have to be tailored so it did not go um, beyond that scope. And so I think that that would be a real challenge. So Jeff, a note in your next book. Yeah, so it's called The United States of Anonymous. It's um, coming out uh, in about a year from now. I'm finishing up the revisions. It actually was a, um, as I was writing this book, there's kind of the uh, discussion, well, you can't see the platform, but you can always see the poster. And so I started looking at looking at that and thinking about that. And it's like, well, that's not always true. They could be using horror. They could be, uh, get, they, they could defeat a subpoena because we have very high First Amendment standards. So 
the book traces the history of anonymity from the Federalist Papers and Common Sense uh, through all the landmark Supreme Court decisions uh, to the John Doe subpoena cases, to poor online harassment. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of these issues uh, now looking more at uh, harms uh, caused by individuals rather than uh, only the platforms. And of course, there's a conventional wisdom that anonymous uh, posters are the worst. Um, is is uh, is that a risk? Perhaps that um, are, are those sort of the issues you're going to sort of engage with? Is yeah, is... I mean, I, I I mean, I I challenge that a little bit. There are some. I spend a whole chapter talking about one particularly terrible anonymous poster, but. Uh, I also talk about what originated the John Doe subpoena cases in the late 90s, which was uh, big companies were really upset that employees were able to go into Yahoo Finance and criticize them because these big companies had never been criticized before. And, um, and so there, there's, um, a, there's some value to anonymous speech, much like with Section 230. Um, I'm trying to look at uh, both sides, but there's and there's value for uh, disadvantaged communities um, to not necessarily have to associate their their real names with their identities. So I, I I look at both the harms, but also the benefits of why people might want to remain anonymous or pseudonymous. We'll look forward uh, to that. Um, let me thank all of you. I know people are in the middle of busy days, so. Um, Thanks for the suggestions for those who posted uh, about the uh, next book. We, we typically poll that. So if you didn't post and you have some ideas, feel free to send it to me or, uh, or Marcus. Um, and um, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Um, Eileen, um, my, uh, my partners here, Hannah and Amanda and Marcus, um, and all of you who joined uh, remotely. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions. There's just so, so, so much to talk about here, um, but um, please join us going forward and uh, do throw out suggestions for the books that you have on your shelf that uh, you kind of need a little bit of a push. And uh, it's always fun to read it and uh, discuss them together. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Good to see you. Happy Monday. Thanks. Marcus, thanks for helping make it happen. Thank you. Bye.